Good morning, church. Good morning. Is my mic on? Uh, Not yet. Yeah. Switch over to Feel free to let me yell over it. I don't have a problem with it. You're on the Okay, we're okay. Uh, I'll say amen. Let me say a prayer. Father, let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are faced with many dilemmas, even here in the church. There's things going on globally. There are things going on locally. There are things going on right within our own church. There are things that could make us weary. There are things that could make us worry. There are things that can occupy our mind, our heart, and our soul. But what do we do? Do we take the things that are happening, such as with our government? Do we worry about that? Do we worry about the potential for a nuclear war? Do we worry about that? Do we worry about the storms that have happened? Because storms are now becoming more frequent and more powerful. Every time we see a storm, it's breaking records, being more powerful than the last. Do we worry about the storm in our church? Is it a storm? I want to direct you to just one scripture to cover all of what I just said. Because, see, the Bible is something that we, some of us take for granted. And here's what I mean by taking the Bible for granted. We memorize scriptures. We quote scriptures. We say, the word of God says thus and so. Yet the power of the word is not within us. So how can the comforter help us if we don't acknowledge even its existence? Should we be concerned about our society that we live in? Should we care what is happening globally around the world? Should we care about the fact that in so many places, people are still being affected by these recent storms? It can be pretty scary. But what does the book of the Bible say in John verses 14? Verses 1. What does that say? Can we turn to that? John 14. Verse 1. Say amen when you have it. I would like somebody to tell me the beginning of that scripture. What does that say? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then surely, surely, I will come again and receive you unto myself. For there I am, there ye may be also. Amen. So should we be worried? Should we be concerned? Should we reach out to help people? Of course. But our hearts should not be troubled. It's really easy to be distracted. It's really easy to get off track, even in the church. Because Satan is using many deceptions to divide us. And one of the deceptions is worry, because when you are touched emotionally, it's hard to ignore what's happening. Very difficult. But what do we do? I will direct your attention to the scripture for today. In 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, we'll begin with the scripture today, which says, and I quote from the King James Version, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. It is really, really important.
important to understand what is happening here. Is this a warning from God? This is a promise. The temple was complete at this point. God was instructing Solomon in his promise. In order for God's the Holy Spirit to dwell in the temple, what must take place? We must keep things in perspective. We must do things decently and orderly. And if we do this, then the promise of God is that He will dwell by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. The whole idea of salvation is not just that we may be saved. Not just that we may be saved. But that we may live a life in victory over what? Sin. Over sin. There are many churches that are just preaching the latter. That are saying that the salvation is about being saved. Salvation is about coming out of the grave and going into our home of glory. But that's incomplete. Because we know from Scripture that the Bible says that our mission here, what is Matthew 28, 19? In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, which is the Great Commission, what does it say? Go out into the nations Make disciples of men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you, and lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the earth. So our goal in the church is not simply salvation through faith and believing that we will remain with the Lord forever. It's, it doesn't stop there. Because our true victory over sin, see, in order for us to truly be about our Father's business, for us to truly spread the gospel, what is the gospel? What is the good news? Is the good news that when you die, you've got somewhere to go? The true good news is that we have victory over the very thing that divided heaven in the first place. See, sin, as we said in Salvation through the day, it, it, sin is not about you personally. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about we. When sin happened in heaven, when uh, iniquity was found in Lucifer, when he refused to reject the temptations that came to him, and he yielded to them, and decided, well, I should be in the place that God is in. So we on this earth are not responsible for sin. But I'll tell you something. When you become personal with sin, you are taking responsibility for it. Because you are judging it according to your standards and not the standards of God. So we are not to take sin personally. It's not about us. Who is the battle truly against? Who's it against? It's against God. Who was accused of not being truthful with Adam and Eve? So let's not take sin personally, even when it's personally against us, because it's not about us. Because the Bible says the battle is not corner. So the true battle of sin is between Satan and God. The Bible says that uh, uh, Satan was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. What's the remnant of her seed? It's the church. So where do we fall in to the sin battle? We are here to do one of two things because there's only two categories. We will either, we will either vindicate the, by the power of the Holy Spirit we will vindicate God in our victory over sin, which is our true nature. Or we will adhere to sin, and the battle of sin and evil we take.
take personally, which means you will personally be responsible for it. Now, which one is it? But what I say to you today is that when we think about where we're at right now, we're here, this is the Sabbath, we have things going on, and I want to make this clear. When you come to church and you join a church and you've accepted God as your personal Savior, what is the first thing a new person should do when they come to church? When you join a church, you're now baptized, you're now a member of the church, what is the first thing you should do? You should have a study partner and you should have a prayer partner. When you join a church, the first thing you should do, find somebody to study with and find someone to pray with. That's the first thing you should do. The second thing you should do is identify what is my spiritual gift? What is mine to do? Here I am, send me. What is, what is my gift? And if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, that's the first thing you should be praying about. Because the Lord says, the Bible says, clearly, everyone has a spiritual gift. Everyone should be participating in the gospel. Everyone should be spreading the good news. Is anyone exempt from spreading the good news? Sometimes we use our circumstances as an excuse not to be engaged in the ministry. Everybody cannot sing. But everybody can be involved in music ministry. Everybody can't cook. But everybody can be involved in nutrition and ministry. We should be doing something. When you come to a sermon, what is the purpose of a sermon? I'm not getting off track of where we're going. I just want to lay a foundation. What is the purpose of a sermon? When you come to church, where I just said the first thing you do is identify a prayer partner. Identify a study partner. So we should be studying God's word. We should be in prayer. Okay? We should identify our gifts. We should be participating in the ministry. Where do we study God's word at in the church? What do we have in terms of programs to help people study the word of God? What do we have? What do we call it? We call it Bible study. So you should be studying God's Word in Bible study. Okay? So if you're studying God's Word in Bible study, where we have instructions, then what do we do uh, in the sermon? If we get instructions from Bible study, what do we get in the sermon? What is the purpose of the sermon? When sermons begin, what did, uh, 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 what did John say? We pray, we get instructions, but what is the purpose? What thus saith the Lord? And I'll tell you something else about a sermon. If a person is truly anointed to preach the word of God, if a person is anointed to preach the word of God, because everybody up here is not anointed to preach the word. If a person is anointed to preach the word of God, then the sermon should be validation of what God has revealed to you in your spirit and your prayer during the week. We shouldn't be up here with any shocks and surprises. Because if we are on one accord in the church, then God is not telling me something he is not revealing to you. The sermon should be vindication of God for what he has already revealed to you during the week in your prayer. So how many of us are praying daily? How many of us are engaged in the ministry in prayer? How many of us hear a sermon that only honors what God has already revealed to you? When the disciples met Jesus on the road after his resurrection, and he said, and he opened up the scriptures to them, and they didn't recognize who he was. And later on, one of them says to the other, did not our hearts burn when he opened up the scriptures to us? 
See, the title of the sermon today, we were talking about anointing. Being anointed for the service of God. Because it's important that we understand what an anointing is. Why is it important? Why did Jesus Christ tell the disciples, go to the city and wait for power to come from on high before you go out and disciple men? We have a lot of ministries in this church. We have a lot of people in the church who are engaged, but are we anointed for service? The reason that this is important is because when you are out there on your own, when you are out there without the power from on high, then what is the result? We are tired. We are complaining we don't have enough help. We want to quit. We want to give up. We are weary. That's the result. How can we honor God in our own, in our own abilities? How can we be about our Father's business when we're physically tired? We're physically drained. We have no energy. We can't even come to the prayer night. We can't come to vestments. We barely show up on Sabbath morning. And when we do, we don't even honor our sanctuary by bringing what we're supposed to bring in here. What are you supposed to bring to the sanctuary when you come on the south? What should you have in your hands? Who, who needs a Bible in the church? Everybody. Everyone should have their Bible. Everyone should reference the sanctuary. In fact, I was in, we was in Bible study yesterday. And I was talking about the sanctuary. Because we need to understand how important the sanctuary is in reference to where we are today. We need to go back to the sanctuary. We need to understand the whole ministry of the sanctuary. If any of you remember, what is the first thing that you see in front of the sanctuary? Well, let's say the tabernacle. What's in the front? Before you come into the tent, what do you see? There's a large basin in the front of it. What was that basin? What was it? It was a bowl. It was filled with water. It was for washing. Why was that important? It was important because if the priest came into the sanctuary and you were not cleansed, what happened to the priest? God's judgment was on him immediately. He would die. So when we come to today, are we coming to the sanctuary with clean hands? Are we coming in our sanctuary cleansed and forgiveness of anybody that has afflicted us? See, when you come to the sanctuary and you come to the altar with unclean hands, mad, upset, grouchy, grumpy about what somebody did to you during the week, then you're coming in, the, you're bringing contamination in the sanctuary and that can't exist. How can God cleanse you? How can He do it? When you have coming into the sanctuary with doubt in your mind. If you want to know what thus saith the Lord, which is a purpose of a sermon, we should be on our knees to you pray. We should go back to our first love. Amen. We should understand the reference of the sanctuary in conjunction with the 2300 day prophecy. Where is Jesus at right now? In the most holy place. How many of us even understands what that means? It's easy to get caught up emotionally with everything that's going on in the world with a storm here, a nuclear war there. People over here got water in their house. People over here don't even still have power. It's easy to get caught up and then forget what we're supposed to be doing. I don't mean to sound angry. I don't mean to sound agitated. I just want to let you know. we got to be on one accord. we got to be of one mind. How can we receive our anointing if we're not even on the same page? 
I want to acknowledge somebody in the church today. Because an example of an anointing is our music ministry. Some of us take for granted our music ministry in this church. Because, like I say, we don't really understand about the anointing. An anointing is when the power of God comes through what you are doing. And when the power of God comes through what you're doing, then that's an anointing. And it spreads throughout the church. And what I want to do is I want to give you an example of an anointing in the church. And an example of this anointing is something that permeates your heart. It's something that affects all of us. But we have taken it for granted. And God says, no, don't take it for granted. Because the purpose of it, the purpose of anointing is to serve God. Set the captives free. Inspire. That's the purpose of an anointing. In our music ministry, if you have noticed, Pat has been singing in this church for years. She plays music. She brings in, such as what happened today, beautiful music. Amen. And it permeates us. We can feel it. We don't have to worry about the fact that, well, she has a good singing voice. That's not what an anointing is. An anointing is something that touches your heart, your soul, your feel. And it ministers to your soul. We should honor that inner person. We're not honoring her. We're honoring the spirit for giving us her. Amen. That's important for us to do in every ministry. But we'll start it today. Matt, will you come up here for a second, please? Just come on. I just want to pray for you. Ricky, here. I need this. I want to honor that. I want to give her, I want to pray for her. Give her flowers. Thank you, Ricky. And I want you to know, God loves you. We love you. We appreciate the spiritual ministry in this church. And I want to pray that God continues to bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And may the music ministry that you produce in this church touch every life, even people who are not here. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. No. <laughs> and I want y'all to understand, again, we're not praising her, we're praising God for her. As we should do for all our ministers. There are people who are doing work that y'all have no idea what they're doing in this church. And they will never get any recognition. They never get any credit. They're wore out, they're tired, but they're served. And we shouldn't let this go without acknowledging because each one of you should be served. That's why we're here. That's what an anointing is. We need a pastor in this church. And when the pastor comes here, I'm telling you now, there's three things a pastor should have. Number one, he should love the Lord. You should know that a pastor loves the Lord. Number two, he should be uh, good with people. And when I say good with people, I mean compassionate with people. Because we have all kinds of people in the church. And if you don't have a compassion for people, you shouldn't be up here. And number three, and more importantly, you should be anointed to preach the gospel. Amen. When he opens up the word of God, if you don't feel anything, mm -hmm. if your spirit is not churning, something is wrong. Something wrong. It's okay. Because this is an anointed position. The same with all of our other ministries in the church. We've got to be about our Father's business. And what I want to do is read just a couple of scriptures before I'm done. In 2 Chronicles, like I said, this is a promise of God. If we look at it slowly, we say, if thy people which are called by my name, who are the people called by the name of God? Who is it? He's not calling everybody. Who's it called? I have said many are called for your church. Who are, who's the calling of God? The church. You know what? Let me digress and say this. Y'all ever thought about the story of Solomon and Gomorrah? Remember that story? Now here's Abraham. He's met 
by Jesus and told Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed. What does Abraham do at that point? He says, well, wait, wait, hold on. What if there are 50 righteous people? Would you not spare the whole town for the sake of 50 righteous people? And Jesus tells him, yes, I'll spare it if I find 50. He said, well, no, let me not be rude. What if there are only 25? Yes, I'll spare it. Let me just, what if it's only 10? Yes, I'll spare it. Was Solomon and Gomorrah destroyed? Yes, it was. What if the angel came to you today? Do we have 50 righteous people in this church? Do we have 25? Do we have 15? Do we have 10? Do we have anybody? What would they say today? Would your name be on the list? We have to think about it. What are we supposed to be doing? It's something to think about. Would my name be on the list? Would they be saying, please spare Brother Davis? Spare Sister Pat. Spare Brother Ricky. Would there be anybody's name on the list? So this scripture that begins with if I people who are called by my name, if you are claiming that God is your Savior, your Redeemer, your Sustainer through Jesus Christ, then they're talking to you because we're the church. Then the second thing it says is humble themselves. Now, we in the church act like we know what spiritual humility is. Spiritual humility. That's what this is talking about. What is spiritual humility? Is it simply being quiet when it's time to be quiet? Does it mean praise God when it's time to praise God? Is that what spiritual humility is? No, it is not. Spiritual humility is when you think of your brother or your sister ahead of yourself. When they are more important than you. When their righteousness is more important than yours. When you think of them. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's spiritual humility. And in order to do that, you can't think of your brother ahead of yourself if you're not forgiving him. If you got anger against them right here in the church. Spiritual humility. Humble themselves. And seek my face. What does it mean to seek God's face? We can talk about this for two hours. We really can. When it says seeking his face. And here's what I, I reference. Do you remember in the Bible when, when uh, um, oh gosh, we remember scripture. In the uh, um, Exodus. When Moses said to God that he wanted to see his glory. That's chapter 34. What was Moses really asking God? Was he really asking to see his face? He said, show me thy glory. And God tells Moses, well, you can't see my face and live. Because our bodies are contaminated with sin. Our bodies, it's over with for our bodies. You can't save these bodies. We said that in Sabbath school today. They're contaminated with sin, can't save the bodies. So you can't have light and dark in the same space. So when God, you can't stand in his face without being consumed. But what does it mean to seek his face? Because everything we do should be done to the glory of God. So that means, where is Jesus Christ at right now? What did we say earlier? He's in the most holy place. If by spirit you are seeking to be right next to him, you're seeking his face. Not behind them, not in front of them, with them. I, he abided me, I abided him. And you can become one, like a man and wife. The Bible looks at a man and wife as they become one spirit. You become one with the Lord. And when you become one with the Lord, what he commands, you do. And your entire being becomes to seek the face of God. You no longer have a personality that is fighting against God. 
You're fighting with God. So that you can look at things through his eyes, yeah. not through your own. And when you look at things through his eyes, then your brother is not your enemy. Your sister is not your enemy. What they have done to you may be the enemy, but that person is not the enemy. See, one of the things personally that God has done for me, 